Hello and welcome to today's webinar focusing on the fascinating and currently extremely hot destination that is Japan. My name's Johnny Bealby, I founded Wild Frontiers and can I just say how wonderful it is straight off to see so many people signing up for tonight's event. Um, over 800 people. So um, of course I know not everyone's watching this live, I think it's about five a.m. in the morning in Sydney, Australia, so I don't blame you there. Um, but wherever you're watching this, whenever you're watching this, uh, thank you so much for joining us. You are very welcome. Uh, so let me just explain very briefly about how today is going to pan out. Um, in a moment, I will give you a very brief description of um, myself and my travels and, and uh, how I set up Wild Frontiers 26 years ago. I'll then pass over to our resident Japan expert, Jim, who, in a slight break from the norm, is not only going to talk a bit about uh, the locations in Japan and how one might get off the beaten path, uh, but he's also going to go into details on how one travels in Japan, dealing with the trains, dealing with etiquette, dealing with the language, and how to make the perfect tailor-made trip to the country. After Jim, we'll then hand over to Natasha, or Tash, um, who will then talk us through our group tour in Japan. And after that, I'll make a few more announcements before we have a Q&A session. Uh, so a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, those of you that uh, are regulars to our webinars will know all this, those of you that aren't. Um, if you do have any questions, please use the Q&A button. As usual, we are recording this webinar. So tomorrow, or potentially the next day, um, you will be getting an email with a link to the webinar so you can watch it again or share it with friends. Or of course, those of you that aren't watching it live will be able to click that link and watch it. Um, so we'll also try to uh, put any answers to questions that we haven't had time to, to answer tonight in the webinar, and we'll give you a few other useful links. Uh, so without further ado, let's crack on. And in order to do that, I'm going to share my screen once again. Uh, and that is the right one. So let's just quickly whip through there. So yeah, um, as I say, my name's Johnny Bealby. Um, I started Wild Frontiers off the back of three big adventures I had in the 90s. I drove a motorbike right the way around Africa. I walked through parts of India, Pakistan and Afghanistan, and I rode a horse all the way along the, well, not all the way along the Silk Road, along the Silk Road from Kashgar to the Caspian Sea. Um, that resulted in my three travel books, Running with the Moon, about the motorcycle journey for a pagan song, about the walk through India, Pakistan and Afghanistan, and Silk Dream's Troubled Road, about the horse riding trip along the Silk Road, which was also incidentally a um, Discovery Channel film. However, <clears throat> most importantly, as far as tonight's concerned, of course, is that it also uh, gave rise to Wild Frontiers. I started the business back in 1998, taking people to Pakistan, um, and we have been running trips all over the world ever since. But today is about Japan, and um, it's wonderful to be talking about this incredibly fascinating and very, very popular destination. Um, it's particularly popular, I think, recently since the relative devaluation of the uh, yen, which has made it slightly more affordable. Uh, but it's also potentially one of the most difficult countries to navigate. Um, how do you use the trains? What do you do with your luggage? How do you deal with the language? Um, and of course, what about the intricate um, etiquette that one has to deal with? Well, here to guide us through traveling through Japan is a man that knows more than most about the land of the rising sun. Jim Hutchinson has uh, lived in Japan for 10 years. He's married to a Japanese lady. He has acted as a travel expert on Japan for another 10 years. He travels there regularly, is a connoisseur of their delicious and varied cuisine. And I think it's fair to say what Jim doesn't know about traveling in Japan ain't worth knowing. So Jim, are you there? And if you are, let's take it away. I am gonna stop sharing my screen. And there's Jim, very good. And I'm gonna cut my camera. Over to you, Jim. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you for the uh, very nice introduction and 
hello to everybody out there watching, listening. Um, very nice to be here to talk about a place that I really, really uh, enjoy talking about. So uh, I'll try and keep it uh, keep it on time and on schedule. But I do get uh, get very very excited about this place. Right, let's um, let's have a look at. Japan and I'll be able to see my map of Japan on the screen. Yep. Great stuff. Thank you. Right. Okay. So here, here is Japan, um, the star of the show tonight. Um, and this is this map is rep the color blobs are kind of indicative of the the prefectures or the regional boundaries or areas of government that make up Japan. It's forty seven of them. Okinawa. The South Island, famous from the Karate Kid movies, isn't um, doesn't appear on this map. Um, but just to uh, just to take you through some of the um, information about Japan, the population currently is about 125 million people. Um, the total number of islands that comprise the country 14,125. Um, it used to be until a few years ago there was only six thousand eight hundred and fifty two but the uh, the government got some updated um surveying technology and area photography and nearly doubled the amount of islands that it's uh within its um remit um the capital of course is tokyo um and it's one of the biggest if not the biggest city in the world um population of tokyo depends on how you Define Tokyo. The city itself is 14.18 million people, um, but the Tokyo metropolitan area itself goes up to 37.19 million. Lots and lots of people. And that's in a city, a metropolitan area that's about the size of the state of Delaware in the US. So there's a, uh, a lot of people in that, um, in that land. If we turn to a more um, familiar Looking map with um, city names, etc. We can see we've got um, Tokyo and Osaka and Hiroshima and and all the uh, the famous cities of Japan um, all on here. Um, but we're going to talk about the four the four main islands rather than the fourteen thousand one hundred twenty five total islands. Um, we've got Hokkaido up there in the north. Um, the main island of Honshu, um, which is this kind of long L-shaped, or backwards L-shaped rather, or J-shaped, I guess, J-shaped for Japan island. Um, Shikoku, just down there in the in the south and in the far southwest, the island of um, Kyushu. Now for tourism, um, Honshu is by far the most visited of these islands. And if we just zoom into this this small area of Honshu, we can see it contains um, Tokyo over here. It's got Mount Fuji and Hakone. It's got Kyoto, um, Hiroshima, and it's got Osaka. And they're all reasonably close to each other um, for these 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 well known cities. And these um, cities tend to make up um, or, um, most people's itinerary for a visit to Japan. Um, and you can get a really, really good trip just visiting these these cities. I've put kind of a, a red um, route marker on the, on the screen there just to show you how they would link up. Um, it's a very valid trip. It's extreme, you get to see, the capital Tokyo, the famous Mount Fuji, the ancient history of of Kyoto, the the modern um, history of of Hiroshima, and you end up in Osaka, which is the the greatest city in the world, in my opinion, and, the, and certainly the best food city in the world. Um, so, um, this is uh, you know, as I said, a great route and exposes a lot of what's great about the country. But what we're noticing, and as Johnny mentioned earlier, as Japan is getting busier and busier, um, especially in the high seasons of March and April for the cherry blossoms, 
or the October, November, autumn leaves, um, these, these famous cities are getting, getting more packed. And this is confirmed on recent um, statistics from the Japan National Tourist Association, or organization, sorry, um, just showing that, that the majority of tourists visit, um, visit these places. The quandary we have, of course, is that these are the famous sites you want to see. Um, you may not wish to visit all of them, but I'd say the chances of visiting Tokyo and Kyoto on almost every itinerary are pretty high. And there's a very valid, um, you know, very valid, valid things to see because they are, they are fantastic. So what we've got is an interesting situation um, and being encouraged by the Japan National Tourist Association Organization, excuse me, to, um, to try to veer off this, this track, include these, these, these destinations in itineraries, but let's try to get off that, uh, off that beaten track and look at what we can do. So this is how we approach things on the, uh, the tailor-made aspect of a Japan trip. Um, and I, before I continue, I really want to emphasize that the scope of this is not kind of to go through every single detail or, or, or option in the uh, you know, Japan itinerary and try to point out all the, the, um, the off the beaten track places because I'd be here forever. Um, I'd probably do it. I'm willing to talk about it for ages, but um, whether you'd all stay with us for that amount of time would uh, <laughs> be questionable. Um, but I think the idea here, let's look at how we approach an itinerary and how we get the mess, the best out of it. And I think um, we just have a look at today's kind of running order. Firstly, we're going to look at the Wild Frontiers um, tailor made trip, how the trips get designed, um, and really so, um, addressing some of people's concerns or or worries about about their trip. Um, so we're going to look at communication and understanding how to uh, how to be best prepared for visiting Japan. Um, look about getting around, exploring Japan. How to get around accommodation and etiquette regarding that accommodation. And finally, come back to this idea of getting off the beaten track. Um, So the first, the first aspect we're going to look at is is designing your your trip, um, and the important thing is our itineraries really are tailor made, bespoke to uh, design exclusively for you. So whatever you want to do, um, then 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 we'll include it in our our trip. Um, so the first as the first step really is an in depth consultation. Um, a really do enjoy those being video calls. I think it opens up a lot. We can share maps and images. We can um, we can look at creating logical routes around Japan, not zigzagging around too much. Um, we can come up with a draft itinerary for discussion after some some research. I'll forward you information on on what we've included, and then a labelled route map to help you contextualise that into you know geographically. Um, we offer a bespoke proposal um, and it covers the aspects of the country that you want to want to see, um, focuses on your interests, be that architecture, art, anime, if you want to go and, and um, look purely at nature or, or, or pottery or, or, or ceramics. There's, there's so many aspects of, of Japanese culture we can address, um, as well as having general tours around the the country so um you know come over and 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 challenge us to uh to uh see what you uh see what you want in in japan um and finally and this is an important bit in 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 the in the pre the pre-tour the pre-departure process is we have what we like to call bon voyage call or or, or just to kind of review when we we'll go through all the documents we've sent to you and it can get a bit overwhelming with Japan because you're that it's still very much uh, a, a paper-based country, and we, it's moving online slowly. But uh, we we'll would we'll take a uh, have a call, get on the on the video call again, go through chronologically, 
what you're doing. And that can invariably raise some questions that, that can get answered instantly and put your mind at rest for the trip. Um, right, so we're gonna go to our next uh, um, slide here and just look at arriving in Japan and what we what we do. Um, so we're gonna fly you um, fly you out of, in this case, the UK and uh, into Tokyo Narita Airport. We're gonna pick you up in a private car and then give you a, a ride into the center of Tokyo. Um, probably won't balance your luggage on the roof as we are in, in this animation, unless of course you bring far too much with you. Um, so here's an idea. So we fly you in from, from um, the UK, um, from across the Pacific, from the United States, up from New Zealand or Australia, um, meet you at the airport, give you a meet and greet, and then and then transfer you into the into the city to your to your hotel. Um, when you get to the hotel, you're going to get your arrival pack, and that will contain contain all the physical documents that you need for your for your trip. So things like train tickets passes if you've got a ticket for a show for a, um, a sumo wrestling match for um, and we also give you um, give you a, a wi-fi dongle um, a lot of western telephones don't seem to uh, work over in japan very well or they can be very expensive and a wi-fi dongle is a good way to uh, you know keep the keep google maps at maps app active um, as well as enabling you to keep your friends and family jealous of the uh, the things you're doing on your trip. Um, but another reason we, we use the Wi-Fi dongle is um, we do have an online aspect of our itinerary. Um, and it, um, it's there to offer you links for your, your free time, should you wish to, to explore the area, give you some... Um, map references and, and suggestions, um, as well as containing information both in, in English and in Japanese, such as your, your hotel address, et cetera, should you, uh, should you have any issues. Sometimes we have issues with some computers not recognizing Japanese text, but online it seems to, to work, work very well. Um, and, um, of course, we'll send you um, information on a local contact. Um, they have phone and WhatsApp for our office in Tokyo. So should you have any real communication issues or just want to clarify or equally change anything, then they are there while, whilst you're on, uh, on your trip. Um, so it's usually at this time when you've arrived in your Tokyo hotel, um, you picked up your arrival pack, you read through, you looked at the train tickets, You've seen how much of the train ticket you can't read. You look out the, the window of your hotel and there's uh, some of it you can read because it's in English or, or Latin characters, but a lot of it. And you start to think um, that this you're never going to cope with this impenetrable language that, uh, that is the, <laughs> the um, Japanese. Um, so I think... It's quite fun and quite interesting to have a look at the, at the language of, of Japan um, and kind of how to how to negotiate it and, and you know how to make it make it a bit of a, of a, a bit more interesting for your for your trip. I believe. I mean, yes, you're going to have help and support throughout your journey, and the menu should all have English versions, and the guides we offer are bilingual at, at least. Um, but I remember, I mean, I first went there in 2002 and I didn't expect to be able to understand anything at all. Um, but it's a poetic and a philosophical language that, um, and even um, at an entry level, offers great gratification um, if you kind of engage with it a little. So I would say, as far as the language is concerned, embrace the communication opportunity. Um, you know, learn some learn some of the essentials, learn to say hello, you know, we've got here konnichiwa for, for hello, arigato, for thank you. Um, 
if you know where the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is or Cincinnati is or even where the Ohio State Fair is, then you're, you're going to know the word for morning, which is, or good morning rather, which is Ohio. Um, learn some, some phrases, some important phrases. I've suggested here my th three most um, useful phrases are koko wa doko, which is, is where am I, or literally here is where. Okawari, which means refill, please. And you can use that for your rice bowl, for your soft drink, or even for your beer um, or whatever you're drinking. Um, and perhaps the most important one here, awa nashi de, which is a way to ask for no bubbles and literally means you know, reduce the ridiculous size head on that beer, please, to a more acceptable level. Um, I would say when you when you're going around, certainly when you meet your guides um, on the on the trip, try to try to use the sand suffix to address people. Um, so that can go after their first name or after their family name, their surname, their their last name, however you, you phrase that. Um, but just putting san at the end, um, it, it's um, it's authentic, it's genuine, and it's 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 appreciated. Um, and the last bit of advice I was given before I, I actually went over to Japan the first time, not knowing a word, was that if I have any issues, and this you know, Google Translate wasn't around at the time, and Google Translate isn't always uh, always great, um, find a young person and write it down, because that um, that young, you know, if they're of high school, university age, they'll have been studying English to a really high level, um, and if you write it down, they will. Um, they'll be able to understand and respond. The likelihood is they're going <laughs> to uh, correct your punctuation and spelling before they respond, but uh, you know, at, at least you've got a solution to a potential, potential problem. Um, and the final tip here is to enjoy the, the written language. It's, it's a fascinating set of characters. There's, there's three alphabets over there, or the equivalent of three alphabets. Two of them have like 46 characters each. And the one imported from China, which is all the symbols, um, has like over, I think there's over around 10,000 characters. The government says you need 2,136 of these to have you know, functional literacy in the country. Um, now, I'm not trying to suggest you need to, to have functional literacy in Japanese to attend there, but understanding some of them is a good way to, uh, to, to, to approach Japan, I think. And it's... It you know keeps your uh, keeps you excited looking at, around the trains and out the windows for where you can you can see some of the characters you you uh, you know and recognise. Um, and let's look at what we might do on our first full day in in Tokyo. Um, firstly, um, inevitably, well certainly if you're flying over from the UK and and the US and and Australia is more on the time zone, but you might find you're a, a little bit jet lagged that first day. But we're going to uh, to encourage you to get up and, and head to breakfast um, on that first morning, and we'll meet you in the in the hotel lobby around 10 a.m. and take you on uh, an orientation tour, if that's not a, a pun, a, it's not intended, an orientation tour of, um, of of Tokyo, and kind of give you an idea of um, of what to um, an orientation to the city. So. Things like how to, you know you might need to learn how to buy a ticket, which way to look when you cross the road, um, how to get a drink from a vending machine, how to hand over money if you're paying cash, um, and when to to tip, which is uh, very very rarely incidentally. Um, but the, so we do that kind of orientation in the context of a, a tour around Tokyo, which focuses on what you want to to focus on. Um, we're happy to take you on a general walk around the city. Um, but if you've got anything of specific interest, a um, museum or a particular building or area you want to visit, then we can include those in, a, in an orientation tour. Um, and how are we going to get around Tokyo? Well, we're going to do it the way the Japanese do it, which is by public transport and on foot. And maybe if it's not freezing in winter or really, really warm in the summer, maybe by bicycle. Um, and just as an idea, here's, uh, here's a little route around, around Tokyo, which works well as a, 
as a kind of an orientation tour that first day. Um, just get my little laser pointer. I imagine for this one, we're kind of staying in this in this area here, just south of Tokyo um, Station, in this kind of the area of Ginza, um, very popular place today with some nice hotels, lots of different levels. Um, but what we uh, what we might do is, is is take a walk across to number one there on that map, which is um, is Tokyo Tower. Great site for uh, if you can climb up it. Often you get a nice view of Mount Fuji um, on the horizon if she's not hiding behind clouds. Um, and then we'll walk north to point number two, which is the the Imperial Palace, the well manicured gardens, which you can um, which you can visit as a as a tourist, um, and then we might uh, might jump on the subway and learn how to how to use that. It's quite an extensive subway in Tokyo, um, very tourist friendly again. Um, and head up to number three, which is the area of of Asakusa. This is the um, the original old town, the old settlement, or the, sorry, the town centre of the old settlement of Tokyo. Um, and it's um, it's got some some really ancient monuments there, the famous Kaminari Mon, which is the gate you see there. Um, and in contrast to its surrounding, it's very very low rise, um, as opposed to the you know the massive skyscrapers that you might associate Tokyo with. From there, you're quite close to the Sumida River, so why don't we walk down to the to the dock or the the pier? Um, and get on a boat that takes us all the way down the, the river, um, kind of slow cruising down to number four, which is the Hamariku Gardens. Really nice way to spend uh, a jet lagged afternoon, kind of relaxing and sitting down and enjoying the, the scenery before heading back to your, uh, to your hotel. So we do all that with a, um, a guide, a fully trained, fully qualified guide um to 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 show you around and answer any questions you may have as you're um as you're wandering around um people tend to stay about two or three days in tokyo so as well as including some um free time to explore and i would suggest give yourselves a, an afternoon or two afternoons to to just go for a wander around tokyo it's it's probably the you know it's, it's got to be the safe one of the safest cities in the in the world it's um, very difficult to, to run into trouble. You can't end up on the wrong side of town because I don't think there is a wrong side of town. Um, the, and the worst that, that, that might happen is you may have some, uh, some, some Japanese people practice their English on you um, if they're uh, so inclined. Um, but things to do in Tokyo in your you know, two or three days there, go and visit the sumo stable, um, this is where the, the wrestlers practice. If there's not a competition on, you can go and watch these. It's, uh, it's an incredibly um, detailed and, and um, sport, and it's, it's, it's certainly worth you know, going to see these. This is early in the morning. Um, alternatively, head to one of, the, one of the suburbs, Harajuku or Akihabara, where you get the cosplay and the, uh, the different uh sex of of youth all dressing up and uh and um hanging out and 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 kind of showing off in their own their own way head up to uh to nico it's about an hour north of tokyo central station and you'll see this fantastic yomeimon the toshigu shrine um unesco world heritage site go for a walk around the back streets of tokyo there's some fantastic food to be found um, or hit the the um, the famous Shibuya scramble in uh, in the town of Shibuya the the uh, famous crosswalk which is uh, you can be there when it's it's midnight there's no sunlight at all but it feels like daylight at street level because of the uh, the amount of of neon and there's so much to do in Tokyo I don't want this to be an exhaustive list just to be representative but eventually, we're going to, have to decide to uh, to move on from Tokyo and move on to our next uh, next destination. So the purposes of this, we're going to suggest we're moving on to 
Osaka, just to illustrate a point about how to how to travel around Japan. And how are we going to do it? We're going to do it the way the Japanese do it by by Shinkansen. Um, these fantastic um, high speed uh, train network that covers most of Japan at the moment is uh, and it's increasingly uh, uh, extending its it, its reach. Um, so the Shinkansen they run on separate tracks to the uh, to the main trains. They used to be known as bullet trains, but the uh, Japan's really really um, encouraging the use of the word Shinkansen to to refer to them now. Um, they run at two hundred miles an hour. They're punctual. They're like they're long trains. You can get lots and lots of people on them, and they connect to the center, or the the, you know, the central station in in most of the cities. You'll be um, you'll be visiting. So um, as I mentioned, let's say that we're um, on the itinerary, we've, uh, we've created heads from Tokyo to Osaka in, it, Osaka in its first leg. Um, we're going to do it the Japanese way, as I've mentioned, by by Shinkansen. Um, and we're not going to pick you up at the hotel and take you to the the main station where the bullet trains or the Shinkansen leave from. Rather, we're going to ask you to make your way to your local station and travel the one or two stops to the to the main station. Um, and if 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 needed, we 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 have platform assistance there to uh, to help you for your first trip. Um, your luggage, um, I guess, it's going to slowly accumulate and get more and more as you uh, as a trip goes on, as you accumulate your samurai sword collection and ninja uniforms and and uh, etc. So your luggage, there is a fantastic service in Japan um, where at checkout from your hotel you can actually send your luggage via courier to your next hotel or even your next but one hotel if you're uh, depending on how your uh, itinerary is um it's it's not prechargeable it's only payable locally but it's a great way to avoid sitting on you know falling asleep on the, the long long bullet train and waking up to have had your suitcase roll a few carriages back and uh, <laughs> um so that's uh, an important Thing to consider um, luggage, maybe taking a small bag and a, and a and and a rucksack rather than one large suitcase. Um, and finally, what we think about when we talk about the trains, it used to be almost a no-brainer to offer people visiting Japan the JR Pass, the Japan Rail Pass, which covers um, trains all on the Japan Rail network, um, including the the Shinkansen. Um, but last October, the price almost doubled for the um, for the JR Pass, and the trains you could use it on were slightly, you know, became fewer, um, including some of the faster bullet trains. So, what we tend to do now is offer what we've referred to here as ad hoc tickets, but specific um, tickets for individual journeys, rather than having a an, an almighty pass. And what that does is it allows us to Book your seats. Make sure that you're, you know, you're, you're sitting together as a as a group, as a couple, as a family, um, and make sure we can get seats close to the the luggage areas on the train if that's what you want. Um, and it also means that we can ride the very fastest bullet trains between destinations, um, which I think is part of the uh, attraction of this fantastic um, transport system. So when you get your uh, your arrival pack in your first hotel, you'll get a number of tickets like this. Um, and this is the train ticket. And you'll notice it's got lots of Japanese characters as well. But they're all fairly, pretty much um, got their, their, their English um, or their Latin trans transliterations on there as well. You can see it's a ticket from Tokyo to Shinosaka Station. Um, you can see that it's departing on the 7th of October, departing at 10.03 a.m., arriving at 13.03, so 1.03 p.m., so a three-hour three hour journey there. Um, and you can see that it's the Hikari 
367 and that refers to the type of bullet train or shinkansen rather that you are uh, you're, you're you're booked on um and when you get to the the station there'll be a big board like this that will have departure time on the left the train in the middle the train number and if you remember we're looking for hickory 367 the train number then the ultimate destination so to um the track it's leaving from and the number of cars so very easy system to negotiate once you've done it once or under the escort of a of a um, um a train station guide then you'll be absolutely fine um you know it's also up here it says reserve seat ticket and this is for the green car there are two classes of travel on the bullet trains you've got your your standard class um this is for the Tokyo to Osaka route. They have three, three, uh, three seats to the side, two on the other side, but the, most of the other bullet trains are two and two. Um, or you have the green class, or the green car, sorry, which is, um, which is kind of a carriage like this, very, very comfortable. Um, and you can only ride this if you, if you pre-book your, your seat and pay the upgrade. You can't just kind of hope there's gonna be a, a spare spare seat um if we continue looking around we'll notice that it on the ticket it says car eight and seat 12a so when we get to the station platform we look down on the ground we'll see that there are stickers indicating hikari which is our train car number eight and then from this you will we'll have kind of lines white lines painted on the on the platform showing us where to uh, where to line up where to queue to uh, get on the train when it arrives um so it's a really really fantastic system um and then as we get on it we kind of head past mount fuji in our bullet train on our way to osaka um and incidentally if you are doing that route we'll put you on the the right hand side of the uh, of the train car so you get this great view of fuji as you uh, speed past in your in your bullet train when you do get to shinosaka station you'll see that not only is it written in two forms of japanese um but equally it's transliterated into into the uh more readable um latin <laughs> uh, alphabet shin osaka but heading from Tokyo to um, Osaka is, I mean, it's a great journey, but it, it's not kind of how we how we do it necessarily. Um, so let's look at what we might do for an actual itinerary and, and let's head for the uh, head for the hills. So we might head north in a bullet train, take us up to, to Nagano, where we're going to transfer into a, a local mountain train and take us into, in this case, Kiso Valley in the in the Japanese Alps. So let's let's head for the head for the hills. Um, so what are we going to do in the in the hills? Well, with Japan being seventy three percent mountains, <laughs> and um, there's a lot of options for. For, for hiking. Um, I'll go through a few now and, and talk about them briefly, but I would suggest if you have time to include a, a short hike, a multi-day hike, you know, a, a, a multi-week hike into your uh, into itinerary, it's, it's um, certainly worth considering. Um, the first hike we've got here is the known as the Naka Sendo. This is the old trading route between Tokyo and Kyoto or Edon Kyoto, as it may have been known. Um, and there are various small towns along the way that were staging posts and trading posts for, for the, uh, the trade that was happening between these two big, uh, big towns. Um, the Nakasendo, you can um, hike in, in a part of it. It's like a three or four hour hike one day, really quite, quite uh, an easy hike. Um, and gets you kind of walking through these these um, ancient, in this case, bamboo forest. Um, you've got the famous hike of Mount Fuji. Mount Fuji, you can only really access it from Tokyo. It's it's a tough couple of days because you don't get a lot of sleep. The idea is you 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 kind of 
you're driven up to a certain part of Fuji. Yes, there is a road going up a lot of it. Um, and then from there, you hike to uh, to a station where you'd sleep from about 11 p.m. till 3 a.m. when you're woken up again to go and watch the sunrise. Um, it's spectacular, but it can be a bit of a, a bit of a highway of, of, of hikers. You know, it's, it's quite popular and it's quite, quite busy. Um, and equally, you've kind of got, you know, the rest of the day because you've not slept all night and you've been hiking. Well, certainly for me, I would be uh, kind of knocked out by that that point. Um, in the north of um, Honshu, um, you've got this fabulous, really rugged area of mountains called the uh, Mishinoku. Um, and down in Shikoku, um, you've got the the, the uh, really fantastic Shikoku 88, which is a hike or a, tre a trek around 88 different shrines that are all uh, all on that that one island. Um, you can be do it. You can do it as, as kind of portions of that, a quarter of them, half of them, all of them. Um, and it's uh, although they do get a little bit repetitive, some of the shrines do look very, very, very similar. Um, it's I've, I've not done this, but people that have done the full 88 have told me that it's it's kind of the the motivation is to complete the 88, and you do get to see some amazing natural landscapes in in between them. Um, this is Mount Aso on Kyushu, and there's a, a really fantastic walk from Beppu in the, the east of Kyushu right across to Nagasaki in the west. Um, and this Aso is the uh, is a live volcano, Mount Aso, that's um, that's keeping all those all those hot springs warm for the uh, to uh, to kind of relax your feet in after hiking all day. So it, and lots of natural hot springs in this area. As well as some some really rugged but scenic hiking, um, I know if you've got the probably the most famous hike in in Japan, the the Kamano Kodo, which is just south of Osaka on the Kii Peninsula. Um, this one you do is maybe a three or four day hike. I would say if, you know, if you're going for a two week itinerary, want some hiking, um, put in there for three or four days. You'll be hiking about ten kilometers a day. It is one of the one. Excuse me. It is one of only two UNESCO World Heritage hikes, um, and it's um, it's 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 quite a, a spiritual one for for the Shinto religion of of Japan. There's there's um, there's a lot to be learned about about that when you're when you're there. Um, so lots of options for getting getting out of the cities and um, off the beaten track that way. Um, so when you are on these hikes, if you're doing a multi-day hike, and I'd suggest that of the ones we looked at, only the Nakasendo is one that you'd do in the in um in an afternoon or a morning or or maybe a full day. Um, you're going to stay in some traditional Japanese accommodation. Here's an image here of a um Minshuku room minshuku and or ryokan they're slightly different but we'll go through that minshuku tend to be family owned small bed and breakfast type places um, and you can see here you've got the tatami mats on the floor you've got in this case three um, futons you've got the low rise table you've got the sliding wooden doors with the paper windows very classic japan scene the only thing that's missing really is the silhouette of a ninja crawling across the uh, the balcony but um yeah i'm sure we can uh, we can ar arrange that um a real can is perhaps a slightly higher end and more of a dedicated hotel rather than a minchuka which is more of a more of a bed and breakfast a real can um you're likely to have things such as a private um naturally heated onsen on your on your balcony um or perhaps nicer grounds to walk around. Um, so we'll be staying in these in these traditional accommodation when we're when we're on our our hikes, as well as in some of the cities as well. It's possible, but um, let's have a look at the you know, some of this um, the etiquette that we might uh, might need to to think about. Um, a lot of the the minshuku and um, Excuse me. 
A lot of the Michigan and Unreal can um, have quite strict check-in times because they are smaller than your massive hotels. They will ask you to kind of not check in before the often 3 p.m. and to check out at exactly you know, 11 a.m. Um, when you enter, very important to remember to take your shoes off. And this is kind of for the whole of Japan. Um, whenever you see a line of slippers lined up, just take off whatever shoes you're wearing and put the put the uh, the next the next set on and continue walking. That's the way I've always always dealt with it. Um, you will see a certain step up um, when you enter the the front door. There'll be a step with slippers waiting for you to uh, kick off your outside shoes and put on your your inside shoes. You might also find that those inside shoes are not allowed on the tatami mats in your room, so you'd leave your slippers outside and then walk in on your socks or a separate pair of slippers inside the the room. Um, in, when you arrive at certainly at the at the Ryokan, um, you're likely to get a yukata, which is like a, a lightweight robe similar to uh, to a kimono, but much much lighter, and you'd be expected to wear that. Um, when you're in the uh, in the accommodation itself, most of these accommodation will be will be half board, so you'll get a a dinner and a breakfast. Um, and I suggest if you know if you are going just to go to to um, for one day's one day's hike, spend two nights at the at the accommodation, kind of arrive at three p.m. one day. Get there, have your dinner, have a nice sleep on your on your food, and wake up, have your breakfast, go out for your hike in the afternoon, have some lunch at um, you know, you'll find some 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 great restaurants or um, even food stands to to get lunch, and then head back in the evening, have a um, have your dinner in the in the real can, have another good night's sleep, and then the next morning after breakfast, um, move on. Um, Tatami, we've mentioned this already. That's the green, to the the grass mats that um, that are the basis of the or the floor of the room, um, and it's 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 important to keep those clean, and therefore that's why the shoes are uh, are um, not allowed. Um, you will be sleeping on futon. The futons don't have a wooden frame like they do in the West. And I think the most important thing to remember when you're staying in these places is that a lot of the bathing um, or washing is going to be in um, an onsen. So um, an onsen refers to a natural hot springs. Not all of them are, are natural. Some of them are kind of slightly gas heated, depending on where you are. Um, but the onsen itself um, would refer to a natural hot springs. And you may not have bath in your room but it would be a shared a shared bathroom um with showering facilities where you'd wash and clean yourself and then a hot hot bath in which you'd be uh, be able to relax um you're not supposed to wear anything or you're not allowed to wear anything in these baths they are separated by gender um and um there is an option um to kind of have a, a private bath on your uh, just outside your hotel room for, for for just you and your 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 partner should you should you wish that but of course that that uh, affects the budget slightly but it's a great experience to sit there outside in a hot you know, like a hot tub I guess um, watching the sunset and um, they've even got little floating trays that you can put in the bath to hold your beer or cocktail or wine or or even a soft drink hey why not um, so. That's kind of the a little bit on the the etiquette of the accommodation. So we're going to kind of look to to come towards the end of this now and talk about the the golden route. Um, so let's just get back um, here. Yeah, so as we said, this is the majority of Japan's visitors that head along this route. But what we can do when we're talking about your your private itinerary is we can. We can look to to stop at places that that aren't on that route, and it might be in this case we've got a train line between Hiroshima and Osaka, and that's an hour and twenty one minute journey on a bullet train. But there are plenty of spaces to top, stop between them. You can see on, on this map here, you maybe see some of the Yama symbols that we learned earlier. It's Fukuyama, Okoyama, Matsuyama, 
Wakayama, um, and we remember that means that means mountain, of course. Um, but if we, as we head between them, let's let's look at what we can stop at and the way that's slight, slightly less famous and e but equally some amazing places to to enjoy. Um, so of course we've got Hiroshima and it, the Peace Park and the Peace Museum and maybe heading down to some of the islands close by. Twenty minutes up the road, where it's just number two, we've got. Um, this town called Onomichi, which is famous for its um, the Shiminami Kaido, which is a, a bicycle track that runs for 60 kilometers across an archipelago of islands. Um, you do it for about two days. You end up on, on Shikoku um, in a town called Imabari. You ride for a few kilometers, stop, have an ice cream, enjoy the beach, get back on your bike, continue on the, on the, on the uh, cycle path. Um, you can head by on some of the ferries to some of the local islands. You chain your bike up at the ferry port, head across to visit Rabbit Island, um, where there's you know, well, lots of rabbits, surprisingly. Um, you can get back on your bike. There's accommodation halfway. It's a really, really nice way to, to get some, some exercise and really get off the beaten track and have a, have a, good, uh, you know, a good bike ride at Onomichi. If we continue another 20 minutes down the, down the train line, we've got Okayama home to one of the three great gardens of Japan. Tash will talk to you about Kenroka when um, soon, which is the, the second one. And there's uh, Kairakuen up in Mito in the north. Um, but in Okayama, you've got the Korakuen Gardens, um, really um, quite beautiful and, and, and worth visiting. Continue from Okayama, you've got Himeji. This is home to one authentic um, Samurai Castle, um, still built of wood, um, freshly painted, and you know they keep the maintenance up. And I say still built of wood because the Osaka Castle and Hiroshima Castle are, are now concrete versions of the uh, of the originals. But this is an authentic one, um, really nice to to visit. You can see it there with the cherry blossoms out. It's it's um, pretty spectacular. Um, and if we continue from Himeji, another twenty minutes down the road, we've got Kobe famous for its beef, <laughs> not in a modern sense of having a problem or a complaint, uh, but more famous for its, uh, you know, its slices of, of tender prized steak. Um, and you can head up on the, on the cable car up into the mountains for some, some golf or some, um, one of the famous onsen up there. And then, you know, arriving in finally in the, the world's greatest city, Osaka, um, there's a phrase saying that if Japan was a house, Osaka would be the kitchen, and can't uh, can't disagree. Um, it's a fantastic place for food, but um, equally important to you know, consider when we're designing your itineraries. Some of these some of these intermittent places that may may be overlooked in a in an itinerary just to uh, give you some uniqueness. Right, I have got overexcited and talked long enough, I'm fairly sure. I'll leave you with this fantastic phrase that I love about, uh, um, the fantastic Japanese phrase that I love, uh, a, a four character phrase. And this says, uh, Ichigo Ichie. And it's the, uh, it means one lifetime and, and one meeting. Um, and describes the, uh, the, this is a good phrase that I've, I've uh, tr uh, treasure the unrepeatable nature of an irreplaceable moment. And it essentially is a Japanese philosophy of enjoy what you're doing, where you're doing it with the people you're doing it with and, uh, you know, embrace that because it's never, never, ever going to happen again. And I think that's a very, uh, very important um, traveling motto, if that doesn't sound too, too cheesy. Right. That's me. I think I've talked far too much. So I will uh, give up my, my um, hosting and, uh, Thank you, Jim. Yeah, if you want to stop sharing your screen, that would be uh, brilliant. Um, yeah. Just uh, wow, <laughs> uh, an awful lot of detail there. Um, but uh, should uh, any of us, uh, those people watching, wants to go to Japan, that's going to tell them how. And yeah. Jim obviously certainly knows his stuff. So I'm going to, uh, we are running over, obviously. So I'm just going to quickly go straight over to um, Natasha 
Jim, you've got to stop sharing your screen. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, so that Tash can share hers. Um, yeah. Tash is going to talk us through the group tour that we have. Excuse me, sorry. I'm just... Tash, can you share yours? You might be able to just share yours and bump Jim out. Mm -hmm. Oh, replace current share. I think I can. Yeah, do that. Sorry. Thank you. All right. <laughs> OK, Tash, over to you. There we are. OK. Good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, as Johnny says, I'm going to just talk through our group tour offering in, in Japan, um, aptly named Japan Land of the Samurai. So. Um, the key little details of this trip to start us off, um, we start in Tokyo and we end in Osaka. It's a 13 day tour and you will have a maximum of 12 travellers in the group with you. Um, and accompanying you, there will be one local leader who of course speaks Japanese um, and also English and maybe another couple of languages under their belt as well. Um, to get there, uh, it's, it's fairly simple. Um, to begin with, most travellers don't actually need a visa um, to stay in Japan for up to 90 days. And that includes the UK, the US, Canada, most of Europe. Um, so, so most people will, will be able to travel there visa free. And to get there uh, for each of our group tours, we recommend uh, a, a set of flights. So we all sort of join together. Um, and these these flights for this tour are with British Airways, where you can book a return Heathrow to Tokyo flight um, and then add a little domestic flight, uh, probably with Japan Airlines, to take you from Osaka to Tokyo at the end of the tour. Equally, coming from the States or um, Australia, sort of that direction is very easy. Most of the major airlines will offer a direct flight. Uh, so it's a nice it's a nice, simple place to get to for sure. Now, unlike most of our group tours at Wild Frontiers, um, the transport we're going to use on this one is going to be the public transport. And as Jim said, the public transport is, in Japan is, is so good um, that we, we want to take advantage of it, you know. So we'll be traveling by local train, by public bus, um, by the, the bullet trains and the fast trains as well, a real selection throughout the tour. Um, because we're on public transport a lot, this does mean that luggage does come into play. Um, so it is good that you, if you are able to carry or wheel your luggage comfortably with you throughout the tour. There will be times where we send it on ahead and you would just take a day bag just for that evening and the next day pick up your main luggage. Um, but yes, be able to comfortably carry it on and off public buses is very useful. And the food, gosh, the food. Um, this isn't specifically a foodie tour, um, but it sort of inevitably becomes one uh, because there is just so much on offer. Uh, we will have some of the very traditional multi-course meals, especially when we're staying up in the mountains. And we'll also be able to sample uh, the more day-to-day -day Japanese food when we're in the major cities. Um, yakisoba, sushi, yakitori, all of these things are, are fantastic to try uh, as we're traveling through the country. Um, if you're vegetarian, that's OK. It's quite easy to accommodate vegetarians within Japan. Um, where we hit slight difficulty is, is gluten free, because, as you know, soy sauce is in everything and, and has gluten in. So uh, it becomes a little bit more difficult, but uh, we try our very best for you. The accommodation on this tour is a real mixture. Uh, we will have the traditional experiences where we're sleeping on futons, uh, we're in ryokans in the mountains. Um, and then in some of the bigger cities, yeah, we do uh, have, I suppose, the more Western style beds. Um, so you do get a, a mixture of everything through this these 13 days. So I thought I'd just talk you through the tour, um, sort of cover the highlights. So as I said, we start in Tokyo on day one and we meet there for supper in the evening. Um, so this gives you the day to fly in and land and get ready. Or if you'd prefer, you can arrive a couple of days early so that you have a, a bit of time to explore the city or, or beat the jet lag, depending where you're, you're coming from. 
On day two, we're up bright and breezy and we get on to our first bullet train of the trip and we head to Takayama. Um, we go off into the Gifu Mountains and enjoy the, the history and the century old houses that are, that are up there in the hills, as well as uh, the hot springs. This is the first time where we will get rid of our main luggage um, and send it on ahead and just take a, a day bag with us for, for that one overnight. On day three, uh, here we're going to get on the public bus and travel to Shirakawago and um, enjoy the UNESCO World Heritage Site of Ogimachi, um, which is just beautiful up in, up in the mountains. We'll also be able to enjoy this village on the morning of day four. And the beauty of this is that we have it peaceful and quiet and empty before sort of the day tourists arrive in the morning. Um, so the earlier you get up on day four, the more you're going to have time to, to stroll around and enjoy this village. Then we move on to Kanazawa and we arrive in time to have a look around the market um, in the afternoon, which is famous for its seafood and its sushi. So uh, time to enjoy again the, the wonderful food that Japan has to offer. Day five, we are staying in Kanazawa and the main reason for that is the beautiful Kenroku-en Gardens. Um, one of the three great gardens of Japan, and you can see from this picture just how stunning some of it can be. Um, and on this, this day, you'll actually have some free time. So you can just follow your feet and enjoy everything that this garden has to offer. Um, think koi ponds, tea houses, lanterns, museums, um, the list is endless, really, and you can spend easily spend a day just uh, wandering around and, and enjoying your time there. But unfortunately, we can't stay there forever, so we move on again. Day six, we are heading to Kyoto. Um, and what a city. We have the afternoon of day six, just getting acquainted with where we are. And day seven, we have a whole free day in Kyoto. Now, with 17 World Heritage Sites in one city, you're going to be spoilt for choice um, for where you want to go. Uh, one example is in this picture here, the Golden Pavilion, um, which you can get to by walking through the city or, or hopping on the subway or on the bus. Um, if you're stuck for which one to pick, your guide can offer you a few suggestions um, that will fill your day, certainly, um, and you can pick and choose what, what's your favourite. This is one of the days where the food is not included on the tour and simply because you have so many options and we want you to be able to enjoy um, so you can explore the city and, and pick where you'd like to eat that evening or, or, or that lunchtime. Day eight, on we go again. This time we hop on the train to Nara and this is Japan's historical capital um, where we have the opportunity to visit some, some truly remarkable places. Um, in the picture is the Todaiji Temple, which is just one of the, the brilliant spots we get to see in Nara. Um, the world's largest wooden building, which uh, I always think is quite remarkable. Day nine, we're moving further away from the cities now, up into the hills and uh, to Mount Koya. Now, this has been a place of religion and devotion and ceremony um, since the ninth century, and you can sort of feel it whilst you're there. Um, there's still over 100 monasteries within this, this area, um, and we're going to be staying up in some of the very traditional lodgings that we have up in, up in the hills here um, and enjoy a, a vegetarian Buddhist um, meal this evening, um, which, yes, is almost like stepping back in time. On day 10, we're up nice and early to enjoy morning prayers with the monks at Mount Koya, and then we're going to take the bus to Kumano Kodo. Now, as Jim mentioned, this is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, this walk, and we are going to walk a section of the trail. Uh, you can see from the picture here that some of it can be a little bit uh, uneven underfoot, um, and our, our local guides always recommend that you bring walking poles for this section, just to make sure you're, you're comfortable. Um, as we, yes, we enjoy this ancient trail. Um, on day 11, we're going to get up and walk approximately seven kilometres of it. Um, 
and with, with our guide explaining of what we're seeing along the way. And we'll finish in our Ryokan in the hot springs to relax and unwind after that day of walking. Day 12, um, we, we head back into the city and quite a remarkable dif difference from our previous few days where we are steeped in history. And now we're in one of the most modern and bustling cities in the world where we get to enjoy our last day of the food, as Jim mentioned, here in Osaka, um, shrines, markets. Uh, the picture here is Osaka Castle, um, which is not uh, an included part of the day, but certainly something you can uh, go and explore if you wish, um, as you sort of soak up the last bit of Japanese culture before day 13, where our tour ends just after breakfast. Um, and we sadly say goodbye. Now, as you can imagine, this tour is very popular. We are sold out for 2024, but never fear. In 2025, we have these three dates planned. Um, so April is designed to coincide with the cherry blossoms and then October and November for the autumn colours when the maple and ginkgo trees really do put on a display. Um, so we'll make sure to get you there at a great time of year. Um, and that's me, Johnny, I'm gonna pass back over to you. Ooh. Tash, thank you so much. That was very concise and very um, eloquent and, and put together beautifully. Um, so everybody, thank you so much for hanging around with us. I'm just going to share my screen very briefly to talk about a couple of things that um, I want to quickly finish off on. Yes, so the next webinar we're going to be doing is going to be on Turkey, uh, which we haven't actually got a date for this yet, but Turkey is an extraordinary country which we will uh, be talking about. Again, another kind of popular destination of ours at the moment. Do please have a listen to our podcast. We've got um, trilogies of podcasts on the Silk Road, trilogies of the podcast on um, on uh, India as well, um, and uh, Algeria, Pakistan, you name it. Lots of different, uh, lots of different um, talks there. Um, so thank you all so much for watching. Um, one thing I would say, uh, Japan, yeah, a hot destination. Uh, we can help you out, whether it's group or whether it's tailor made. Um, as Jim said, he loves to talk about Japan. Um, and he will create for you whatever you wish to do there. Um, and the group tour, as Tash has just explained, is all open for 2025. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We're going to leave you there. We will answer. There are four or five questions on the uh, board. We will answer them um, tomorrow in the email as we've gone over. And I know most of you are going to be wanting to go and get supper or go and get coffee or whatever it is your time zone. Uh, wishes you to do so thank you all so much and uh, we will bid you adieu goodbye <laughs>